So um, we're going to go ahead and get started for panel number two, um, and I'll do the same same thing. Introduce everyone in a condensed way. Uh, but up first, we have uh, Stacy Clarkson. Uh, Stacy is the art director of Harper's Magazine. Um, she uh, work that she has commissioned has won recognition from the National Magazine Awards, the ICP Infinity Awards, Frontline Club. American Illustration, American Photography, and Communication Arts. She was nominated for Photo Editor of the Year by the Lucy Foundation in 2013 and 2014. We wish her luck for 2015. Um, Chat, and she's going to be um, discussing her role at Harbors as an art director and a photo editor, and in particular discussing a project by a photographer named Chad Rez. And um, Chad is a Los Angeles-based photographer. His work has been recognized in uh, Photo District News, American Photography and Communication Arts, the International Photography Awards, the One Show, DNAD Awards, the Con Advertising Festival, and his project, uh, America Recovered, uh, which will be discussed today, uh, a survey of the ARRA, and that stands for American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, was accepted at Photo Santa Fe, awarded distinction by the Ford Thinking Museum, and has been published in Harper's, uh, the Wall Street Journal, and online in Time Magazine's Lightbox. The second presenter is Christina Orson. Um, she has many, many titles, but I'm only going to name a few. She is the Western New York Regional Director of Empire State Development and the Project Coordinator for Governor Cuomo's Buffalo Billion Investment Plan. And in addition, she serves as executive director of the Western New York Regional Economic Development Council and on the board of Buffalo Urban Development Corporation, Erie County Land Bank, and Catholic Charities. And our final presenter uh, this evening will be Jonathan Solomon, who is the director of architecture, interior architecture, and design objects at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and uh, the editor of the Art and Design Journal 45. His most recent book is called Cities Without Ground, and it's published by Oro Editions in 2012. Uh, previously, uh, he edited the 306090 book series um, for over a decade and served as curator of the U.S. Pavilion at the 2010 Venice Architectural Biennale. Um, so, um, an immense thank you to um, all of you, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stacey. Thank you, and thanks, Jordan, for including me today. Um, so I'm going to take a slightly different approach as well. I'm going to talk about how uh, the government money through the state has been invested a billion dollars um, in the Buffalo area and how that is working essentially for the community to create opportunities for the citizens in the future through primarily job opportunities. And I want to talk to you about both how we chose to invest it, but also equally important where we're investing. Um, and that's really all about spatial efficiency and uh, how we revitalize our urban areas. It all really began, though, it started with the citizens because this was a bottom-up process. So the governor made the commitment of a billion, but he turned to this community and stakeholders led by volunteers, the Regional Economic Development Council, who then engaged um, uh, thousands of citizens in a community-driven collaborative process to identify what were, what were the real assets, unique assets that we had in our community that we could leverage, um, that could become our foundation for how we successfully invest the state money, the billion dollars, to really catalyze long-term sustainable development in our community. Not sort of one-shot, quick hits, but long-term sustainable development. And so through that process with citizen engagement, stakeholder engagement, and also working with experts from the University of Buffalo Regional Institute, Brookings and McKinsey, um, we leveraged the billion dollar commitment uh, to develop a plan that basically focused in on, on um, investments in three strategic industry sectors where we really had some assets to start from and build on and uh, invest in three key enablers, and I'll talk briefly about each of those um, as, as a foundation for revitalizing our community. But before I get into some of the areas that we're investing in, I want to talk about why we are investing all of it in our urban areas, uh, in Buffalo and Niagara Falls in particular. 
And this is all compliments of actually, again, the great work done at the University of Buffalo Regional Institute as part of the One Region Forward work that they've been doing. But essentially, we are one, we are the only actually upstate community that uh, not just in our city, but in our entire MSA metropolitan area region lost population. Um, amazingly, while we lost a uh, population, 16% of our population between 1970 and 2010, uh, we sprawled in a way that you just can't frankly understand when you're losing population. Um, and uh, sprawl without growth, of course, has major implications on our environment, our property taxes, our tax burden that we pay, and the economy and infrastructure. In the past 20 years, we've added 525 miles of new roads, again, in an area where the population was declining. That costs us an increment of $26 million per year to maintain. So we still have the existing infrastructure that's now more aging that we have to maintain, and then we built all this new infrastructure that we, you know, cost us to build and then maintain. Um, we commute to work by car more and take less transit compared to several decades ago. Uh, because the job, not only have the people moved out, but the jobs moved all over our region. Um, since 1990, we've added 525 miles of new roads. Uh, again, you can see some of the implications on the cost of the annual tax burden. The vehicle miles traveled per day has increased significantly, uh, and, and that is the result of both people moving out as well as employers moving out of, of the urban areas, um, which makes it extremely challenging, by the way, if you are relying on public transit to actually get to jobs when the jobs have been dispersed all across our region and transit can't get you there. That then led to, I won't get into the whole, uh, that analysis, but extreme pockets of poverty in our urban areas um, because people can't get to some of the job opportunities. So if we kind of continue business as usual, right, there's two models here essentially, uh, which is we continue that sprawl and the population doesn't grow. Uh, you can begin to see how this is going to play out in our future. On the other hand, if we start to refocus our development back to the city and utilize our already developed and urbanized areas, and that's where our new housing development and our new job development is, um, you know, we can have a, a significant positive sustainable impact on our community. So how the scenarios uh, compare, again, you can start to see uh, if we do business as usual, meaning we continue to kind of sprawl, employers continue to move further and further out, transit proximity to new homes is 1% versus back to the city, uh, you're able to access through public transit a lot more of the job opportunities. Uh, decrease uh, miles traveled, uh, decrease the number of new lane miles that would need to be built. And of course, this all comes down to bottom line, if we take it back to the impact on citizens, a huge economic uh, savings, frankly, and benefit to the community if you go with the back to the city model of growth versus the business as usual and continue to sprawl. So that is why the entire Buffalo Billion has been focused on revitalizing our urban area, primarily Buffalo, but also in this case, Niagara Falls, um, and really uh, rebuilding the city for the 21st century. And as I mentioned, it's, it's all, uh, focused on developing three cluster industry sectors um, based on assets that we already had. So the first was we already had invested a lot of public money into the development of the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus. You have the major healthcare institutions there, you have Roswell Park Cancer Institute, uh, University of Buffalo already had a presence, and of course these buildings are the medical school, the new children's hospital. Many of those were all, all to a large degree, public investments that had already been made. <coughs> So we had a great asset base of developments. We had a cluster beginning. We have great research and development and healthcare going on. The piece that was really missing on the campus is the private sector jobs. How do you start to translate what happens there in healthcare and research and development into the next generation of sort of biotech and pharmaceutical uh, jobs on the campus? And so where we're investing a portion of the billion, 50 million, 
um, and you'll see these are all uh, large-scale investments, um, is in the development of a new medical innovation hub. Some of you may be familiar with the building under development right now called Conventus on the medical campus. Part of that will be medical offices. We're not, the 50 million isn't going to that part. But several of the floors in that building are going to build out this new medical innovation hub. What's unique about the way that all, almost all the billion is being invested is we're actually investing it through a SUNY partner. Um, and in this case, it's the College of Nanoscience out of Albany. Um, so we're investing through a state partner in facilities and equipment so that essentially it remains as a state asset, which frankly reduces our risk as opposed to granting that money to one private company. Um, that then if they don't meet their obligations, this is ultimately all about job creation and private sector investment, if they don't meet their obligations and we grant them the money, we don't have as much recourse other than to attempt to recapture that money. In this case, we retain ownership of the asset, physical buildings and machinery and equipment, and then use that asset to partner with private sector companies that we know have the expertise and capacity, in this case, to really uh, catalyze um, translating medical research into development. So AMRI is our anchor partner that'll go into this building and their expertise is in new drug development. They know how to take uh, products from research to commercial application. Um, and so they will, in addition to our 50 million, they will make a significant investment and create directly uh, 250 new jobs, but that, that's not that's not the whole thing we're getting for 50 million. It's really intended that they're the anchor and our agreement with them is then you start to network us into your suppliers and your customers to get them to also co-locate in this new campus-like setting. And so you'll see a kind of a pattern of how we're investing across these strategic industries in these uh, state assets in partnership with an anchor company who will work with us to really um, uh, leverage a lot more jobs through their supplier network relationship. Doing a similar thing in partnership with the University of Buffalo and the New York City Genomic Medicine Center, again investing, investing in University of Buffalo and in, in continuing to significantly enhance their supercomputing capacity, which is absolutely critical for companies who are doing uh, research on uh, genomics and creating the next uh, wave of essentially personalized medicine. So companies, uh, and you can see some of them here, who will have a partnership with UB, utilize uh, the, the facilities and equipment that UB has. In turn, those companies are committing to create jobs in New York City, in Buffalo. And then another one, we're partnering with IBM, certainly a well-known household name, and they're gonna be locating in what, what was known as the former Key Center in downtown Buffalo that's uh, was largely going to be vacant. Um, and again, we're condoing out and purchasing several floors in that, and they'll be the anchor of a new IT innovation hub. And we will work with them to bring in other like companies um, to anchor that new development. In advanced manufacturing, our single largest investment, 750 million in state investment, some of which is coming out of the billion, some of that is loan financing from other state sources, is going into a former brownfield. So again, uh, a, a critical component of the overall Buffalo Billion is how do we start to reuse the assets that we have in our community. You know, part of our industrial legacy is we have many, many hundreds of acres of brownfields that have been left abandoned and, um, uh, you know, we're not really working for our community anymore. So in this case, on River Bend, which is in South Buffalo along the Buffalo River, we're taking what is the, the site of the old Republic Steel. So in our heyday, when we were one of the leaders in steel manufacturing, that's where Republic Steel is located. They employed about 2,500 people on this site back in the day. It's been a vacant uh, a property since then. It was cleaned up, um, and this is gonna become the new home for the high-tech manufacturing hub that'll be anchored by Solar City. This will be the single largest solar panel manufacturing facility in all of North America um, and employ over 3,000 jobs and again we're working with them and you can imagine it's a million square feet the supplier network that will need to feed this type of operation facility so we'll be partnering with them to start to 
work with them on how can we also locate your, your suppliers in and around uh, this hub at uh, Riverbend. Um, and then to help our local manufacturing base, which is a, a, a still a, a very important part of our economy, and in fact, it's the third largest industry sector, but made up primarily of small to mid-sized manufacturers who have a hard time competing, we're creating a new a manufacturing <coughs> institute, essentially a facility, kind of think of it as a shared resource for local manufacturers to be able to access really um, applied research and development services that they couldn't necessarily afford in-house on their own, export assistance, workforce assistance, and process improvement. And that'll be opening again, it's just on the edge of the uh, Buffalo Niagara Med Medical Campus in a building that's being renovated for, for that. So shifting from manufacturing to the uh, uh, other key industry sector, which is tourism, and, and really simply, the reason we are investing in the tourism economy is because we have this amazing asset in our backyard called Niagara Falls that already attracts 8 million visitors a year. The problem is the 8 million visitors a year spend about an average of four hours visiting the falls. You see the state parks, you see the falls, maybe you do Maple the Mist, and then you go, because there's really not much else to do in Niagara Falls, US. And we've done a really poor job of, of communicating in a compelling way that Buffalo is actually just 15, 20 minutes from Niagara Falls and you could spend three days here, you know, spend a day in Niagara Falls once we offer more to do, spend a day or two visiting arts and architecture in Buffalo and then you could also go down to Chautauqua and the Institute. So we're investing in really creating the city of downtown Niagara Falls into the world-class destination it should be with, for visitors that come from around the world. And the whole point is get those visitors to stay, not four hours, but two or three days, and that means a lot more money in our economy, and that translates into a lot more jobs. So the idea here, the plans that were put together, is really we don't want to be what Niagara Falls Canada is. Um, that, that's fine that they've developed in the way that they are, but that's not what we're trying to accomplish. You know, Essentially, we want a city in the park. We have, this is one of the most you know, beautiful uh, places in parks, and you can see all of this is all along the gorge in the, the waterfront is all parkland. And so we want to develop the downtown in a complementary way so that you really ultimately do feel like it's a city in the park. And um, so we're, we're making a number of strategic investments in the type of developments that we want there. Um, need to be complementary and need to focus on um, both family destinations but also really capitalizing on that outdoor recreation market that we find this appealing. So one of the developments that we're working on is there's the old Rainbow Mall that was inside parking garage and mall that's been vacant for, I don't know, probably 20 years. Um, we already developed in partnership with Niagara County Community College a third of that mall into a culinary institute. It's a training center and a culinary center today. But that still left two thirds of that former mall vacant. That's the single largest building in downtown. And it really, if you actually try to walk from the park into downtown, it's almost like a bunker. It sort of looks like a big concrete barrier. Um, so. We did a solicitation for proposals and we chose the Wonder Falls Resort in partnership with Uniland uh, to anchor redevelopment down there, recognizing that we have to provide more options for people, things for them to do when they visit Niagara Falls to get them to stay here. So yes, part of it will be an indoor water park, which is appealing to young people, but a big part of it will be the way that they're uh, going to develop the restaurants and entertainment and amenities is in a way that it tells the cultural heritage story of our community. So that it's not big chain restaurants, but it's local restaurateurs. Things like that were an important part of our selection of this team and moving forward in how we develop the place. Uh, another big part of our development in Niagara Falls, again, we have a, a great asset in, in Niagara Falls State Parks, owns all of that parkland. Um, but really, you know, other than kind of doing cave of the winds and made of the mist, in an appropriate way, we haven't offered enough for the outdoor recreation and entertainment uh, interest. And so we did um, an RFEI and are in the process of selecting a partner to work with us in New York State Parks to significantly enhance the options for programming and outdoor recreation in the parks. 
uh, again, in a, in a way that still maintains the integrity of the park. But think about, you could be doing zip lining in the Niagara Falls Park. You could just uh, be doing, uh, they don't have a lot of scheduled recreational things in the winter at all now. They don't have, you know, um, uh, nature walks, horseback riding, um, um, all kinds of different sort of outdoor adventure programming that, again, can turn that four-hour stay into an eight-hour stay. And now you think about, I should stay overnight and then spend another day in the region. And then uh, one of the most critical pieces, and, and actually one of the only investments we're making in pure infrastructure out of the billion, is the Robert Moses Parkway. And in this case, we're undoing a mistake from the past. Um, so the Robert Moses Parkway was built um, years ago um, as essentially a, a four-lane divided highway coming into Niagara Falls. You can see the, the uh, uh, river there and uh, the current uh, highway here and this if you go right down there you go into the state park and if you come here you're into downtown and if you actually drive it right now they, they bermed they put this huge berm up so i mean it physically in every way possible cuts off the city in the downtown in the community from the waterfront in every way possible from the berm to a four-lane divided highway that you'd have to attempt to cross to get over to the waterfront um, so we're undoing that uh, and turning it back to what it should have been. Um, and uh, this is, it's actually under construction right now, but you can see it's all about turning it into a true parkway, traffic calming with a circle, um, you know, a removing down here when you start to enter into the park, it just goes down to two lanes and, and taking the entire burning down, putting it at grade. And already what we found is that five hotel developers, um, some are right, I think one is right here, because it's opening up that access, they are investing in their properties. Um, and so we've had five development projects announced in either major renovations or new hotels in downtown Niagara Falls um, that to some degree I think were tied into, you know, we're renewed confidence in Niagara Falls but also the understanding that the way in which we're gonna build it going forward is to help reconnect with the citizens and the tourists to that amazing waterfront. Of course, we also need to invest in the people. We need to ensure that our community has the right skills to be able to take advantage of the job opportunities. And in particular, what we found is um, in, uh, I'll talk about advanced manufacturing uh, specifically, that um, over the next decade, we're gonna have 17,000 job openings in just the advanced manufacturing sector. <laughs> For the most part, that is all because of retirements. So we have a very aging workforce, in particular in manufacturing. Um, we've lost an entire generation of people who are trained in skills trades, whether it's welding, machining, electrical, electrical mechanicals, still very good paying jobs in manufacturing. And we simply don't have enough to replace the people retiring, let alone the growth we're projecting as we start to regrow our manufacturing base. So a big portion of our investment is going into starting to provide the next generation of the workforce with the right skills uh, so that they can fully participate in these job opportunities. Um, and doing it in a way that we enhance and value diversity in our workforce more and ensure that, that people who have been in poverty have opportunities to participate in this resurgence uh, and revitalization by again getting connected with the right job training opportunity to get into skills to be able to go into the jobs. Um, so we're investing in a number of programs. Uh, one in particular is a partnership uh, with Elfland State Technical College and Burgard uh, High School. Burgard is one of those public, public school high schools that years ago graduated uh, students in technical skills, welding, auto tech, and machining. And unfortunately, over the years, became one of the failing schools in the city of Buffalo. But We've committed to a new partnership with Elkwood State College to transition that high school into a middle college, which essentially means the students will have an opportunity starting in the 10th grade to take college level courses offered by Elford at their high school in either machining, auto tech, or welding, three high demand areas, and graduate in the fifth year essentially of high school uh, with an associate's degree and be completely job ready. And we have industry partners who are working with us. Some are donating machining and equipment 
um, but also providing input on the curriculum who will be ready to hire them when they come out. So this is all about starting again to rebuild that pipeline and ensure that people have the right skills to have access to the job opportunities. And then, of course, the final piece is we want to foster new growth and new startups. Unfortunately, our region historically has seen more companies um, close or fail than we've had startups. And so it's been important to, for us to try to catalyze more entrepreneurs coming to our region, more entrepreneurs starting businesses in the region. And that's why we funded the world's largest business plan competition. Some of you may have heard of 43 North. We ran this last year. We're about to launch it for year two. We awarded $5 million in prizes. Top prize was $1 million. Uh, 11 different winners. They've all, some of them were from Western New York. Many were from outside of the region. But they, if they're going to win, they all have to come here. They have, we have an incubator space. Uh, in the Innovation Center on the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus where we're housing them. And the idea is we keep running this competition year after year. We start to sort of stock the pond with lots of new entrepreneurs and startups. And some of those go on to uh, be successful and grow and be the next job generators in our community. And then the final piece is we have to do a better job of linking our people and ensuring that people have access to the jobs. And so that's why we created a $30 million fund for, called the Better Buffalo Fund, which is all about investing in transit-oriented development, trying to get more residential development along the transit line um, uh, to increase the access, access to transit and get people to utilize transit more. And then, of course, it'll be connected to all the job opportunities that are being focused in the city. And then the other piece is we're also uh, redeveloping an old industrial corridor called the Northland Avenue Beltline, which is over on the east side of the city, you know, where ECMC is. It's a few blocks from there. Um, one of those, again, sort of largely blighted, <coughs> vacant brownfield area. It's about 40 acres, 900,000 square feet of um, vacant buildings that uh, we will be partnering with the city on redeveloping into the next you know, site that will be ready uh, to um, house a future growth in businesses. Continuing to invest in our waterfront, it's one of our key assets, ensuring that it's available and open to our community and the way that we build it. And um, so far, you know, I think hopefully you're feeling it, those of you that live here and see it, um, you know, I think that the early talk is that, you know, Buffalo is starting down the right path. And we expect this to leverage very significant investments, over $11.3 billion in economic impact in our community when fully deployed and creating almost 14,000 direct and indirect jobs. So um, there's, we created a website, so buffalobillion.ny.gov, so that the community can understand how are we investing this. We'll continue to post progress. We'll post when jobs become available workforce training opportunities, uh, because ultimately this is all about really creating jobs and investing in our community's future. So, thank you. All right. Um, well, first of all, uh, uh, a thank you to Jordan um, uh, and to Omar and to Bob for the invitation, um, for putting the panel together and for inviting me to come out. Um, I was a Bannon Fellow myself at uh, the University of Buffalo uh, now 10 years ago, uh, in 2005, which, um, of course, I was only 12 years old at the time, um, but uh, it, it, it does seem to have gone by fast. Um, it's been terrific to see some former colleagues and um, to meet others. I got to meet Jordan G, who I had known only through Facebook, but now know um, IRL, which means in real life. Um, the, um, but it, it, you know, my time, my time here at UB, um, I, I spent um, really uh, looking very closely at one of Bannon's books, Megastructure, which is um, you know, part uh, uh, critical history and part um, almost parody um, of uh, a particular moment in uh, kind of academic and professional vogue in architecture. Um, and it didn't feel that way at the time, but ultimately that close look at that work became um, very in meaningful and impactful for me in, a, in a, a decade in which I looked very closely uh, at um, why both Jordan and, and Keller write more eloquently about this than I do, so I'm kind of at a loss for words, but, but looking at the structures of 
various regimes of power, including state power, um, uh, that, that give structural hierarchy to contemporary urbanism, um, specifically things like continuous air-conditioned interiors, um, large shopping malls, um, interlinked train stations and housing estates, etc. Um, and, and in fact, in looking at the way in which their aesthetics, the way they look and the way they operate, um, might differentiate. In any event, um, I'm, I'm going to talk today about a particular um, building and a particular architect. Um, it's a presentation that I'm going to confess is a little bit unformed. I took advantage of the invitation to start a new project, in short, and I'm hoping um, that this conversation begins a kind of workshopping of it that moves it forward. Um, the building is, um, it's a building and it's a, a person and it's an amount of money, so it's about $172 million in 1980s dollars. Uh, the building is the State of Illinois Center, um, now the, the James R. Thompson Center in downtown Chicago. Uh, and the architect is Helmut Jahn, uh, and the year is 1985. Um, the locals are calling it the Spaceship and the Star Wars Building. When it was dedicated a few weeks ago, the atrium was draped with a huge banner reading a building for year 2000, and since then, the crowds have come to gawk as they have not at any new building in downtown Chicago in years. Uh, that's Paul Goldberger writing in the New York Times, July 22nd, 1985. Helmut Jahn's uh, James R. Thompson Center, formerly the State of Illinois Center, opened in Chicago in 1985, an office building for state services. It is 17 stories tall and 1.1 million square feet, and distinguished by its curving reflective facade and full height, 160 foot diameter public atrium. Though embraced by many for its optimism and jaunty postmodernity, the building eventually became the subject of varied controversy surrounding its cost, 172 million in public funds, up from a projected 85. Later scrutiny fell on its aesthetics, from its shape to its salmon pink and pale blue palette and its environment. Failure in the cooling system caused interior temperatures in its first two summers of operation to reach 110 degrees. The center's current disrepair has been the topic of features in several local news outlets. I've been collecting material in the State of Illinois Center out of a conviction uh, that it is an important building, marking a transition in Jan's career from playful exuberance to an increasingly refined techno-sublime. It is a rich and complex artifact of an important moment in the development of the postmodern citizen. Referencing classical expressions of civic unity and centralized state power, the dome, the plaza, these amount to nothing more than feints in traditional hierarchies. The building's rejection of modern, rejections of modern style are well recognized and recorded. Its reformulation of the relationship of the citizens of the state are not. Uh, and it is this that I would like to focus on with special attention to its aesthetics and its environment. State of Illinois Center erases boundaries between interior and exterior and between building and infrastructure, confounding definitions of public space. Rather than expressing the role of the state, it conceals power behind material and spatial spectacle. It situates government above an intermodal transit interchange permeated by multi-level interior urbanism. Where the apotheosis of contemporary techno-sublime is an environment so precisely modulated that the subject never perceives he or she is being compelled to enter, to move, to work, to shop. The State of Illinois Center exerted an explicit and at times even malevolent presence in the lives of its inhabitants through its subversion of comfort. Eventually mollified, these inefficiencies underscore the level of control the building exerts on its environment in ways that the refined systems utilized in contemporary practice obscure. Um, the remainder of this presentation will be composed of photographs and drawings of the State of Illinois Center I have uncovered in my uh, short few months of research and excerpts from, texts, uh, excerpts from texts produced by the State, by Jan's office, and by critics of the building at its opening and following. Um, I have an interview scheduled with Helmut next month and I'm looking forward to adding his voice uh, and those of other sources to this project. I've never made a presentation in quite this way, so if I lose your attention, I promise it'll be over fast. <laughs> we wonder if Illinois Governor Big Jim Thompson gave taxpayers even the slightest thought last November as he finally moved into his nice new office, which includes a private elevator, kitchen, bath with shower, and bulletproof glass walls. 
he'll, he'll probably slough off the cost overruns with the shame shame of the architect and contractor who build out over their build over their bids. Philip Schreiner, Building Design and Construction, March 1985. He has hot hands. Stanley Tiger in 1998. It is germane to recall a few other things about government buildings in Chicago, particularly since Jan considered all of them in the process of conceptualizing what the state center should be. The Daly Civic Center is probably the most brutishly powerful international style skyscraper in the United States, a monolithic brooding building that seems to stand guard over the loop like a gargantuan armored knight. It is diagonally across Randolph Street from the Yon building. Directly across the street is the City Hall slash County Building, a classically styled structure whose huge Corinthian columns rise from a granite base. Jan's prime acknowledgement of these two neighbor, neighboring buildings came when he oriented the state of Illinois Center's curved southeast facade toward the older structures. He made a secondary bow to the past by echoing City Hall's granite in the base of his own building, and he carried on LaSalle Street's canyon tradition by bringing the colonnaded west side of the center out to the curb. Yet Jan did not try to make the center contextual, in the sense that most architects use that word. He does not believe in contextualism. Paul Gap, Chicago Tribune, 17 February 1985. It is the most cerebral, the most abstract, yet easily the most spectacular building ever constructed in the loop. In a city where architects so long worshipped the 90 degree angle and black curtain walls, the center's asymmetry and multicolored skin appear as almost impudent nose thumbing of the past. Gap, 1985. The state of Illinois Center is hyperactive. It might be called architecture on amphetamines, a building that is so utterly relentless that it seems never to let you go. Mr. Yan wants his building to implant itself in our consciousness. Goldberger, 1985. In warm weather, eight giant ice cubes, each weighing 100,000 pounds, are frozen at night when electric charges are about half the daytime rate, then used to cool the building the following day. The 40 by 12 by 14 foot cubes are frozen in huge ice banks in the building's sub-basement, 37 feet below street level. State of Illinois Capital Development Board, 1985. It is surely not unfair to say that architectural decisions invited severe cooling and sun glare problems, even if others were responsible for solving them. The architects, after all, decided on such matters as orienting a huge expanse of transparent glass towards the sun. Paul Gap, Chicago Tribune, August 10, 1986. Summertime glare has been particularly intolerable in the state of Illinois, in state of Illinois center offices where it roasts occupants while creating blinding reflections on their computer screens. Several workers tried to solve the problem with a sun umbrella, a gesture not intended as a joke. Some 1,600 sets of Venetian blinds were recently hung on windows in the curved section of the building wall facing southeast. Fixed at a permanent angle, they are practically invisible except at close range. The blinds have cut computer screen glare and reduced air conditioning needs by several hundred tons. Typical central air conditioning unit in a house puts out about three tons. Still, the cooling system remains deficient by a large margin. Gap, 1986. One man consults his watch while the other sits and waits in an elevator stuck for an hour and 15 minutes in the state of Illinois Center in 1987. A power surge resulting from a storm knocked out controls on the elevator, stranding it at the fourth floor, Chicago Tribune, 2014. The circular atrium, 160 feet in diameter, is one of Chicago's most exhilarating interior rooms. It is not, it is not easy to make an atrium with glass elevators seem fresh in this age in which every suburban motel has one of its own, but Mr. Yan has done that. This room, with its great wall of glass looking out onto the city, its glass roof and its hanging staircases and exposed elevator shafts, is full of movement and energy. Goldberger, 1985. Charged with creating an institution, with the caveat that it was to be a well-used and truly public facility, Jan had drawn inspiration from two primary sources. One was the example set by the design of traditional capitals and other government buildings, from these, he took the idea of a spacious domed rotunda, 
but we interpreted it in contemporary materials and shapes. The other was the lively activity of many European village squares and American big city plazas in the summer. That was the kind of use Jan wanted for the state center. To make it possible year-round, even in Chicago's frigid winters, he put his plaza indoors under glass. Jan's final shaping of the center and, its exterior and, and his exterior declaration of its volumes came to, came to little good for all its glassy reflectivity and color. The building is a chunky wedge of little grace or elegance. No courtier could save the fat girl at the senior prom. Gap, 1986. <laughs> the blue panels of glass on the facade are surely the most disturbing thing of all. Their turquoise tone is a color that calls to mind cheap commercial buildings of the 1950s, bus stations and suburban schools and the like. Is Helmut Jahn, whose sense of trends is as sharp as any fashion designers, doing this intentionally, gambling that the current vogue for 1950s design will eventually grow to encompass even the dreariest relics of that decade? I doubt it. Paul Goldberger, 1985. In the roaring 80s, when he was turning out flashy Art Deco revival skyscrapers, he dressed like a roaring 20s gangster, favoring double-breasted jackets, broad-brimmed fedoras, and ballooning pocket handkerchiefs. Blair Kamen, Chicago Tribune, 1998. The building's odd shape has altered the maze of offices within each ring. Some are square, some rectangular, some combinations of square and curved. Some have narrow, pie-shaped corners. Some have walls in no particular shape. Depending upon one's sense of direction, this can be exhilarating or merely confusing. All such complaints pale in the face of one big gripe. Many offices don't have doors. Even in a state where strong sunshine laws interesting, can make shutting one a civic sin, bureaucrats don't like to do without doors. Very few people can have doors, grabs a new arrival to a friend as they strolled around her mostly doorless domain recently. It's one of the cost savings. Only very important people get doors. It's going to take a while to get used to. Kevin Close, The Washington Post, April 8, 1985. The overall shape of this glittering and gargantuan object is not easy to understand. It is easiest to start with the floor plan, which is best described as a rectangle that has been broken by a long curve which runs from one corner to the middle of the opposite side, Goldberger, 1985. The straight sides of this polygonal shape rise straight up, whereas the curving side slopes inward as it rises, giving the building its startling rocket ship-like profile from many angles. Within, there is a circular atrium which slices through the roof and emerges as a sliced-off cylinder that is the building's crown, looking as if it were about to revolve. Goldberger again. I've often wished that Jan could have designed the building now, toward the end of his career, as a mature master, rather than at the beginning, when he was prone to overreach. Its concepts were sound. Blair Kamen, Chicago Tribune, August 13th, 2014. The building's pronounced curves and spatial excitement dispensed with the boredom of the steel and glass box. Instead of standing aloof from its urban surroundings, it engaged the city linking with everything from the downtown headway system to the CTA's loop-elevated tracks. It prized openness long before transparency became a buzzword. The row of granite columns framed the public space along the street and enclosed the plaza. The atrium carried this public space inside the center. Came in again. This was all done in 1979, when the idea of making the city more accessible, a more pleasant place, wasn't really on anybody's mind, Jan said. In many ways, the design was ahead of its time. Came in again. The State of Illinois Center will be a hub for transportation to and from the loop, with built-in access to elevated and subway trains, a planned hookup to the city's extensive loop tunnel walkway system, and the new transportation center with a 1,400-car garage, parking garage and direct connections to O'Hare, now under construction just across Lake Street. Within the state center itself, the CTA will open a new station for the Lake Street Transfer, the most frequently used transit station in Chicago. This station will have the capacity to accommodate 2,700 commuters per 15-minute period. 
Together, these transport connections will bring a steady flow of pedestrian traffic through the concourse and ground floor level of the center, State of Illinois, 1985. The architect made a rather good beginning at the base of the center, where he used pink and gray granite, a visually formal material that was meant in part to speak of government's nobility. Column bottoms are exposed in an acknowledgement of the center's frame, a diluted modernist reference. Gap, 1985. Some of the granite was deliberately and whimsically made to appear tacked on, almost dangling. There is an historicist suggestion of keystones, too, although they, have not present, although they are not presented in the overly contrived manner favored by most postmodernists. Gap again. Jan's decision to run a colonnade around the building was meritorious. Gap. At one point, there are metal columns outside the stage set, columns of granite. Elsewhere, they reverse, so that the metal is on the inside. At one point, the granite hits the ground. At another, it is suspended. At one side entrance, the granite makes a kind of formal arch, but, the key, but with a keystone of glass, as if to show that this, too, is not any more than a game. Goldberger, 1985. The arcade is designed to give a smooth transition between the exterior and the interior public spaces, emphasizing the penetration. The arcades are incised into the interior public spaces, uh, incised into the lower floors of the building, rather than protruding as a distinct structure. The, land, the use of granite at, the, at this pedestrian level gives a continuity to the street grid along the South Street. As the building curves away from the property line, the granite arcade continues so as to prevent disassociation of the plaza and the building but diminishes to emphasize the southeast entrance. Jan, 1985. It is a building of openness and accessibility to symbolize the openness and accessibility of government as it should be conducted. The attributes of this building will serve as an inspiration that will continue Illinois' reputation as a great state and Chicago architecture as the best in the nation. James Thompson, 1985. Mysterious stains first appeared on the polished granite flooring in the lobby more than seven months ago, and the stains continue to appear. Building officials said the stains are caused by water that seeped into the grouting between the concrete blocks and should disappear in time when the water finally evaporates. Dave Schneiderman, Chicago Tribune, December 23rd, 1985. The mere presence of a 16-story atrium <coughs> and a bunch of shops and eating places in a state office building, turns it into a genuine public place. And the building has already begun to establish itself as a kind of covered town square. It is filled with tourists, with workers, with Chicagoans who linger after doing business in state offices, and with Chicagoans who are merely passing through its cylindrical atrium as a convenient means of cutting across a block. Goldberger. Where else can you meet a friend for a cup of coffee, enjoy a light snack or a full dinner, buy a suit, fill a prescription, visit an art gallery, an estate agency, renew your driver's license, attend a concert, and catch a train home, all without ever going outside. State of Illinois, 1985. This is not, after all, the kind of building that suggests a cynical hand behind it. Its vulgarity is the vulgarity of over-eagerness, of wanting desperately to like and be liked, of trying too hard to please. And it does please, in the end, even as it annoys. The arcade, for example, that runs around the outside behind the mock columns of granite is a splendid urban gesture, self-assured and strong, despite its often gimmicky detailing. Goldberger, 1985. All of this adds up to the, build to the public building as carnival, a better image, surely, than the public building as forbidding box. And it is an essentially welcome image in this city, with its harsh winter climate and its absence of large-scale public interiors. Goldberger again. The building is denied the richness that goes with warm materials, while at the same time, it fairly bristles with another type of richness, activity. It is exciting to be in the atrium, on the balconies, and in the office trays. Jim Murphy, 1985. Having toured one of Jan's buildings, the Chicago architect Harry Weiss once cracked that he had served on a Navy destroyer in World War II and had seen enough pipes. Blair came in 1998. And I'll end here. 
Some Chicagoans apparently have learned to love a building they once loved to hate. Helmut Jahn's James R. Thompson Center, once derided for its spaceship-like form, was one of two structures named favorite, favorite commercial office building in a random survey conducted last week in downtown Chicago. The survey of 530 people was conducted Tuesday and Wednesday by the American Institute of Architects, which is holding a joint convention in Chicago with the International Union of Architects. The convention, titled Architecture at the Crossroads, Designing for a Sustainable Future, ends Monday at the Auditorium Theater. On Monday, the convention is scheduled to issue a Declaration of Interdependence, a statement of principles encouraging the construction of buildings that use less energy than conventional structures. Leaders of the convention released a new draft statement of the Declaration Saturday. The draft says that sustain sustainable society meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The draft adds that architects will commit themselves to consider environmental and social sustainability at the core of our design work. Uh, that's Blair, Blair came in writing in the Chicago Tribune, June 20th, 1993. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Um, so we have um, a few minutes for questions um, for anyone here. But um, maybe, again, I'll take the lead. I have a question, my request to you maybe ham-fistedly link all of these together. Is this thing even worth, worthwhile? Um, so in my kind of perhaps ham-fisted way of linking these presentations together, um, there's two things that seem to bubble up. One is the question of abstraction um, and knowing whether or not you are in or inside or outside a public space. Um, and the question of how you recognize that. Um, I think ending on the Dorothea Lang photograph was really great, because you have um, uh, the New Deal and all the programs that were wrapped into that, along with um, more or less a publicity and marketing campaign to send writers and photographers out to broadcast what this is. Um, famously on the architecture, a lot of the projects themselves there were medallions that said this is a WBA project, or, um, um, PWA project, and so that question I think lingers, uh, and maybe it's um, to kind of apply this to all the presentations for Christina. You know, how do you know that you're being that you are within these um, stimulus projects? How do you know that this is the state at work? And um, you know, if, and, and Jonathan, the way you mentioned it, the question of whether this is an office building for the state or a mall is one of the key um, questions when you enter into this thing. It is an abstraction. It's not necessarily just an architectural abstraction of um, a heating and cooling um, spectacle or whether pink uh, granite means public space and civic architecture. But um, it's really a question of how you relate to the kind of system that you're into. So um, trying to formulate that into a question, but. How do, I guess, these architects, but also um, funders of the state, start to recognize what is in general an abstraction from funding on down to architecture itself? Um, well, the, the Obama administration has had trouble with this. They can't do any PR with a lot of these projects because not the whole project isn't funded by just the stimulus money. So it's funded by other things. So they can't claim it as, as their own. This isn't really responsive to your question, so I apologize for that. But, but you know, the, the 
this is three very different presentations, but but um, two are more like each other than the other one. Mm -hmm. And in the, in this sense, um, <clears throat> the the uh, Recovery and Reconstruction Act was um, initiated by a call for shovel-ready projects. You didn't get money unless that project was already conceptualized. And those are in plan and ready to go. I mean, and, those were th and those were projects all over the country that um, local constituencies, if you factor the question of citizenship and of, of, of democracy, however it's working in, in, your, in your local community, those were projects that got uh, 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 originated there and wrapped up into this big thing. The billion is, I mean, just looking at Solar City, um, that's a project that, that the city of Buffalo has been working on for 20 years. I mean, the, the, the master plan, before the master plan, for that site is from the mid-90s. Um, a, a, uh, a, a lot of the work that's gone into this is scooping up the ideas of, um, of entrepreneurs and uh, political leaders and local communities and saying, well, there's money to be had, you know, there's money for this now, let's go do it. The planning that, you know, I, I, did, a, I did a project um, 15 years ago with the urban design project called Achieving Niagara Falls Future, and we went and we collected all the plans that had been done about Niagara Falls for the previous 20 years. So that's like going back to 1980. And we said, what are the ideas here? What are the values here? And, and we sort of whipped this up into what was really a wish list for the city of Niagara Falls. Well, here it comes again. I mean, the, the, the plan for a city in the park, you know, it's not a new phrase around here. Um, so there's, you know, in this kind of chaos of planning and dreaming, there's there is a kind of a democratic impulse. I could contrast that with, you know, this is the, you know, this this building is the, I mean, you know, any building that size is a huge collective effort, but it's it's mainly the inspiration, uh, you know, of the author, um, not of not this kind of crazy collective agglomerative process that has a, a kind of a democratic quality to it. So I I, I just think. It's a huge contrast in, in these um, in these stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to pick up on something. This may have been what you intended in your question and uh, remarking on Dorothea Lang. I, I was also really glad that you ended on that, in part because there's what you what you uh, refer to this kind of grand difference from Works Progress Administration, where there's the recognizability of the kind of medallion ability of the mm -hmm. works. Um, but there's the impulse to hire photographers for documentation, um, and sometimes for documentation before a work, work is done, to uh, really uh, commit government funds to the recording of things, um, even things that are really brief. And I wonder what the photographer himself, if he has communicated that to you, or what he makes of this fact that it's a self-initiated project, and even the kind of uh, presence of it, this kind of contrast between text and image, for me is very evocative of um, certain like um, instructional artworks in the sixties, almost on Kalara or something. And I, I wonder what what he feels about the fact that he's got to pay when he gets on a plane to wherever. Yeah. It's very frustrating because he he reached out to them and he said, you know, you don't have any photos at all. Mm -hmm. Which
interest in, in having photographs of these projects is purely political. Once there's an image of the thing that the government is spending money on, then suddenly it becomes you spent $275,000 on a ladder for fish, right? And while it may be an entirely justifiable and very valuable project, the kind of visualizing of it and the identification of it as a government project suddenly shifts it out of a category of things that people want or need uh, into a category of things that people in that kind of code switch that, that you tried to illustrate earlier suddenly can't abide. Um, and, and it seems like a, actually a fairly consistent uh, position. I can understand that. Yeah, it does, except they are being transparent. So you can look up the numbers. They're there on the website. The power of the image is so strong. I know. Right. The other thing that strikes me about these three public investments is they're all very different ways that public money is utilized. So the Chicago was intended to be I mean, a landmark, but also it was intended to be a public space the way we designed it. They wanted the public to be able to use it, right? The federal money, when you look at 84 billion, there's lots of little 100,000, 200,000. It was intended to be jobs while they were doing the development, but long term, you know, I don't know what it created. Uh, you know, it's amazing to me, honestly, an eighty-four billion dollar that there's a lot of these little hundred thousand names out there. And I remember now, actually, I remember at ESD at the very beginning of that, we were asked to put together lists of shovel-ready projects, and it was literally just communities coming up with lists of what's ready that we want to get a piece of this pie. Right? It wasn't strategic and 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 then you know the billion was the exact opposite of that it was all let's put a strategy in place first to set up long-term investment in our community and there was actually some criticism from that because you know today even three years later the jobs haven't started yet because we took our time to be really thoughtful about the way in which we're going to do this because it's really about the long-term benefit so they're all very different ways Public money, I'm not saying one is right or the other, but it's all very different, you know, ways of investing. Within the Buffalo Billions, is there a, um, is there an idea how to document and publicize these projects? A kind of specific, if there isn't for, for the, you know, what might, the AR, ARRA, um, is that something that you looked into with your program to kind of combat some? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the main thing is we, again, we created a website. I think we've been very intentional. Every major milestone, right, there's a press release, there's a press event, there's a press announcement. At least I feel like it. I go from one to the next sometimes. But, you know, to try to let people know what's going on. So we wrote ground on Riverbend. I'm sure there'll be a, you know, a huge grand opening on Riverbend. There'll be a huge thing when the jobs, right, there's job openings come and apply. So I think that it's going to, uh, consistently, I guess, be a drumbeat of progress on each project to show what is happening with them. But the ultimate end game is we're hiring, right? There's, there's an econo economic stimulus with more jobs being created for location. I'm almost preparing your question this, this possibility of, of these two issues. Like, so the Buffalo Billion is, I mean, it's remarkable when planning is really interested in how it's overcoming past difficulties between different authorities or different divisions or how the government's to the open. But um, uh, artists, they talk about Buffalo, the culturals as they're called, as being important in terms of, of developing the economy. Mm -hmm. And that there's been various studies that prove for a dollar, a dollar to go to culture, there's five to six that are returned. So it, even if you're just interested in money, don't care about art, it's still an important thing to consider. So I'm wondering, like, you know, poss the possibility, because we're still at the beginning of this, um, structuring some kind of, of uh, possibilities, working with artists to interpret these stages of development, transition from a brownfield to a solar panel factory. So almost like the utilization of looking at our city as a landscape that's occurring right now, and maybe not necessarily a documentary photographer, because photojournalism is very important, mm -hmm. but it serves a very different role than artistic impressions of, or interpretations of different projects. So um, I don't know if specifically in the Buffalo Bay, there's a certain percentage or there's certain um, conduits for funding to go into fine arts, performing arts, um, of course architecture is art too, I mean that's an expensive term, but, um, sorry, that's all. No, that's good. good. I mean, I think it's an interesting idea to sort of, in a, in a, in a documentary way, to start to document the progress, and then you could probably, again, put it together kind of one press release, press announcement, press <coughs> event at a time, but um, it 
is an interesting idea. And we don't have specific money through the billion for cultural and arts. There's other state funds specifically for the New York State Arts and Culture that are dedicated to investing in that very important aspect of our economy. I think um, there's in accompanying the, the photographs, the Chinese photographs, is an essay by Ian Bulmer, and he talks a lot about how you connect these things. to a person, a really simple but really complex problem. And the problem of the Shovel Ready project being one, that it's already there, the project, the, the, the um, problem of the fact that the country already has a highway system, that there's so much, right now Buffalo is a shrieking or um, shrunk and now expanding city, that there's already a lot there. And so what do you do with that? It's a transformation, or it's a redevelopment. I think, I think the quote he says is you can only build the Hoover Dam once, right? You can't keep doing projects like that. And so therefore, every time that this, um, this um, problem comes around, you start to go from Hoover Dam to fish ladder. And there's just a dissonance there. everybody um, who's been here today and participated.